Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the Europe Center. My name is Christophe Crombe and on this rainy Northern California day, we are having a panel on a very depressing topic, democratic backsliding in Hungary and Poland, mm -hmm. and even more depressing, the lack of EU enforcement of the rule of law. But we have three excellent speakers on this topic and I'll introduce them to you in the order of their appearance. First, uh, we have Kim Lane Shapley. She's the Lawrence Rockefeller Professor of Sociology and International Affairs at Princeton University. Uh, her work focuses on the intersection of constitutional and international law, particularly in constitutional systems under stress. She's lived in Hungary and in Russia for a long time. And uh, today she will mainly focus on the recent events in Hungary in her opening remarks and uh, the uh, prospects uh, for a democracy or the lack thereof in, uh, in Hungary. Our second speaker is our director, Anna Guzmala Bus, uh, who is on leave uh, this year at the Center for the Advanced Studies of the Behavioral Sciences. She is the Michelle and Kevin Douglas Professor of International Studies at the Department of Political Science. And she's also a senior fellow here at the Freeman Spoli Institute for International Studies. Her research focuses on political parties, state development and transformation, informal political institutions, religion and politics, and post-communist politics. Anna, in her opening remarks, will mainly focus on uh, Poland. And our third speaker is Daniel Kehlman. He's professor of political science and law and chair of the Department of Political Science at Rutgers University. He's an expert on European pol Union politics and law and has written a whole a bunch of books about it, including a, a book entitled The Transformation of Law and Regulation in the European Union. In his opening remarks, Dan will mainly focus on the European Union and its enforcement or lack thereof of uh, the rule of law in its member states. So I'm going to ask each of the three uh, speakers to um, open with some remarks for about five to eight minutes. Then I'll follow up with a few questions and then we'll open up uh, the floor to questions from the audience. If you wanna ask a, questions, a question, which I very much hope so from the audience, uh, then please use the, um, the Q&A feature at the bottom of, bottom of your screen. And I will then, uh, when we get to the questions, I will then uh, recognize uh, the questions and go through the questions that you have asked. Mm -hmm. So that also means you do not have to wait until we are done with the presentations, so the opening remarks and with my questions, you can enter your questions at any time during the presentation starting now and I will get to them when we have our Q&A session. That being said, I'm very happy to turn over the word to our first speaker, Kim. Great, thanks. And I uh, brought some slides to share and don't be alarmed by the number of slides you see at the bottom because I don't have that many slides for this presentation. Um, so first I'm gonna, uh, you know, first things first, let, let me get the slides moving here. Oops, which is that? Um, so I know Ukraine is sort of in the background and maybe in the discussion, we can get into the question of what Ukraine has done to shape everything we're talking about today. But I'm gonna start by giving you some background. So um, both Hungary and Poland, which Anna will talk about, have been falling far and fast in all the democracy rating institutions. And so with 2020, Hungary, which is here in green, had finally slipped from being a, a consolidated democracy at the beginning of the decade to being what's called a transitional or hybrid regime. Poland had fallen out of the category of consolidated democracies and I'm gonna leave that part to, to Anna. So the question is, you know, what happens when countries cease to be consolidated democracies anymore? This is a very busy slide, but you know, Hungary is here in yellow falling down through all these other countries to the point where Hungary is now down in, country, in, in amongst countries that would never be admitted to the EU now, and Poland is kind of following. So I wanna talk, I'm gonna, my part of this conversation is to talk to you about what happened inside Hungary. But I also want you to think about the fact that Hungary is a member state of the EU. And in addition to the dysfunctions inside Hungary, Hungary is also at the table and in the decision-making process for what happens in the EU going forward. 
Dan has called this the other democracy deficit. I call this the new democracy deficit. And so at the end, I'll just cycle back and mention a couple of the threats that poses. So since 2010, Hungary has become now a competitive authoritarian hybrid transitional, but basically not democracy um, regime. And just to recap what really quickly what happened. So Viktor Orban and his Fidesz party came into power in 2010. They'd been in power once before in a coalition. So when people voted for them in 2010, they probably didn't look dangerous. But immediately after Orban came into power, he started this constitutional revolution in which he rewrote the constitution, he rewrote the basic legal framework, and all of it pulled in one direction, which was toward the capture of independent institutions and the redu reduction of checks on his power. So he captured the constitutional court by changing the procedure for adding judges and then packing the court until it was full of his adherents. He also captured a whole set of other independent institutions. The Electoral Commission, actually he had to fire the Election Commission three times before he got it the way he wanted it. Um, the public prosecutor is completely loyal to Orban and his party. The state audit office has been captured, the media board, the national bank, and I might add the procurement office, the competition office, and we can just list every single independent institution. There's nothing left in independent or opposition hands. This has been accompanied by a wholesale attack on civil society organizations through punitive audits, through the tax code, through restrictive legislation, through harassment. Um, it's a wonder any of civil society has survived, but not much is left. Attacks on academic freedom. So you probably heard that Central European University was pushed out of the country and is now in Vienna. But what hasn't been so widely reported is the privatization of almost all state universities that happened just in the last year. So that virtually every university has been converted from a public to a private institution governed by a board of Orban's cronies. And by making these institutions private, they've eliminated all academic tenure and they've eliminated all efforts to see what these institutions are doing with their funds. And they've eliminated functionally all academic protections. Coming soon, because I suspect after this election, we're gonna see more of that. All of the critical media have been silenced except uh, you know, very occasional websites before they get taken over, but there's no broadcast radio or TV left that reports independent perspectives. Most of the newspapers are in the hands of oligarchs and even the online platforms are now almost completely governed by Orban's people. This has been accompanied by xenophobic, anti-Roma, anti-migrant, anti-Semitic mass campaigns, except Ukrainian migrants are okay. Um, but still, there's always an enemy that Orban's railing against. Um, and uh, Ukrainian migrants are fine, but by the way, in Orban's electoral six, you know, victory speech last week, he attacked Zelensky. So, there's a reason why the Hungarians hate the Ukrainian government, which we can go into later. Um, massive amounts of corruption in Hungary financed by EU funds. That's apparent to everyone. It's one of the things the EU is finally getting riled up about. And then rigging of elections, 2014, 2018, and 2022. So ac across this, Freedom House was very slow to lower its rankings of Hungary, but even Freedom House now thinks Hungary is a hybrid regime. Uh, actually, if you have access to Art TV, there's this movie. Uh, this is you know movie called Hello Dictator, <laughs> which was how um, uh, Jean Claude Juncker greeted Orbán at a European Council meeting at at one point. Um, but you know this, everyone knows that Hungary's trouble. The Varieties of Democracy report said in 2020 that the EU now has its first non-democratic member state, right? And it's the most extreme case. All right. So I want to I want to tell you what depressing happened just in the last week quickly to close on a, a depressing note. There was just an election in Hungary last Sunday, and if you've been reading the papers, you know that Orbán won. But here's what was surprising. So here's a chart that shows you the the election polls. Orange is always Fidesz. Here, green is the opposition. And until the eve of the election, the parties were about five points apart. You know, Orban, everyone thought Orban would probably win, but he wouldn't win with a super majority. And let me just say that when Orban keeps winning two thirds majorities in the parliament, that's significant because the constitution says that the constitution can be amended by a single two thirds vote of the unicameral parliament. So any government that gets two thirds of the seats 
can basically put itself above the law by changing the law from morning till night. All right, so we saw these polls going into the election. Some of us even held out some hopes the opposition could win. So that's what it looked like. Uh, and here's what happened. Sorry, it's in Hungarian, but hey, it's Hungary. Um, this just gives you a picture of the seats that Orban won. Again, orange is Fidesz, green, the light green is the opposition, the united opposition. The dark green is like a neo-Nazi far right, like really, really far right, even farther right than the Jovic you used to know if you were following these things. And then there's this one blue seat, which is the quote, German ethnic party. Orban wound up with 54% of the vote when there was no poll that predicted that. The opposition came in with only 34% of the vote. Again, no poll predicted that. And because of the disproportionality in the system, with 54% of the seat of the vote, Orban again got 68% of the seats. But this picture is even worse than it looks. So in this little field of light green, which is what the opposition, the united opposition managed to get. One thing to remember is that Orban was up against, well, a united opposition. It consisted of five center left to some, somewhat more center left parties. Uh, and then this former far right wing party, Jobbik, that had cast off its most extreme wing, that's what turned into Mihazank, and the moderated Jobbik went into the coalition. And they did that because the way Orban's system works is that, is that 106 of these 199 seats are allocated in first past the post, no runoff constituencies. And the only way in a multi-party system at the opposition could win against Orban's candidates in those districts was to put up one candidate against them. And to do that, they united all these groups. So it turns out that a number of the seats, not the single constituency seats, but Hungarians also vote for a party list, of the seats that the opposition wound up getting, nine of those are Jobbik seats. <laughs> and Jobbik is the party that used to vote with Fidesz a lot, okay? So the opposition isn't even that strong. The Mihazank people may well vote with, with for uh, Orban. And this little quote, German ethnic party, it's a trick for Orban to get one more vote, <laughs> which is to say that it's not just two thirds that he got, but he's got, depending on how the votes turn out, way more than two thirds of this parliament. Um, this just tells you the single member districts, you know, even with the United Opposition putting up one candidate against Orban's people, they still only got 19 of the 106 constituencies. Now, this is really busy, so let me just hit some highlights. What happened? <laughs> so a lot of what happened is that the election was rigged, um, and I'll just give you a couple of the highlights. So when Orban came to power in 2010, he cut the size of the parliament in half. He gerrymandered the entire country so that he's been winning on these gerrymandered districts and the districts are hugely unequal in size so that the, his districts were mostly the districts where there are 55,000 or so voters. The districts won by the opposition had almost 100,000 voters. So it just rigged. Um, the, there's a, I won't go through winter compensation. The other two things is that the electorate has been shaped by Orban. So he gave the right to vote to ethnic Hungarians over the borders. And this time there were 252,000 votes coming in from outside the country of which 98% you know, went to Orban giving him an additional two seats. And at the same time, he's pushed out a lot of people who are opposed to him, but he makes it very hard for the expats to vote. <laughs> it's a really ingenious system through which he's basically diminished the votes of his supporters and raised up the votes of the, uh, diminished the votes of his opponents and raised up the votes of his supporters. But the final thing that really determined it this election was there was a new law passed in November called by the opposition, the voter tourism law. For the first time in this election, anyone could register to vote anywhere in the country which is you could pick your districts, or rather Orban could pick which of his voters voted where. And so it was sort of clear, even in the run-up to the election, there were rumors that Orban was gonna take all of his voters from Budapest and relocate them to the constituencies that they might lose. And that indeed seems to have happened. Um, and so this voter tourism simply meant that Orban could put you know, his voters at anywhere. And so there we are. So I'm just gonna conclude by saying Orban's now really and truly entrenched. As some of us have been saying for some time, this is what autocratic elections look like. 
there really is no chance of getting rid of the party in power as long as it controls everything. And now Orban has insisted and looked at, you know, he's now turning his attention to Europe where he's going to be the disruptor in every single issue that involves unanimity. And he's gonna make life miserable, I'm afraid, for European institutions from henceforth. And I'll stop there, thanks. Thanks, Kim. Anna. Great, thank you. Um, so uncharacteristically, I'm going to be the voice of slight optimism here. Um, and I'll make three brief po points about Poland democratic backsliding. So much like in Hungary, we also have a single party government um, in Poland in the Polish case since 2015. It's a conservative nationalist party with equally questionable democratic commitments. But here we come to point number one. The Polish autocrats have all the commitments of the Hungarian ones, but half the competence. So we also see them attempting to politicize the courts with court packing and forced retirements. We have the rise of a disciplinary chamber, which is, exists to basically uh, curtail judicial freedom. The government media is full of despicable propaganda. And there are definitely the same kind of attempts that we see in Hungary to divide the country into good Poles who support the government and the traitors opposition. But unlike the Hungarian scenario, the Polish government doesn't have a constitutional supermajority. It's a single party majority government, but it doesn't have the ability to transform the constitution. More importantly, it simply isn't competent. So there's been an enormous amount of legal confusion where instead of sort of massive constitutional change, what we get instead are conflicting versions of the law being sent between the Senate and the lower house. Attempts at gerrymandering went nowhere. Attempts to go after the free media also failed. We don't see the kind of massive interference in the economy um, or in sort of regulating it the way that we do in Hungary. And it's not for want of trying. It's just simply that um, either there was enough opposition from the media and from society, or more simply, these attempts failed because they never had, they were never very well thought out. We don't have the kind of enabling laws and clear legal change that we see in Hungary. Moreover, there's still free media, a vibrant civil society, and opposition parties to hold um, these incompetent authoritarians in check. The second point I would make is that the relationship to Hungary has also changed. So Poland and Hungary basically um, traditionally rely on what they claim is you have 500 years of Polish-Hungarian friendship. More cynically, these two leaders, um, Orban and Kaczynski, had basically supported each other throughout. They basically formed sort of a mutual veto pact um, and acted in solidarity. But now, because of Ukraine, um, we see sort of a divergence between of them. So Orban basically capitalized on the invasion and in the dying days of his campaign promised cheap oil and himself as a peacekeeper that will keep Hungary from entering the war. In contrast, in Poland, you have very strong support for the Ukrainian government. You have a wide acceptance of Ukrainian refugees. And Kaczynski, the peace leader, were unequivocal in condemning Russia. He, in fact, even told Orban to see an ophthalmologist um, if Orban couldn't see that Russia is victimizing Ukraine. So we see a divergence here um, in what used to be a fairly tight relationship between these two. And that matters because, of course, they supported each other and prevented vetoes, sorry, prevented some sort of unanimous um, condemnation of their actions in the EU. And third, um, I would argue that the relationship to the EU by the Polish um, government is considerably more differential. We now see new bills um, that are going to attempt to undo the most flagrant violations of court autonomy, and specifically the disciplinary chamber. And this matters because the EU has frozen COVID recovery funds that are worth something like $36 billion for Poland. Um, and the European Court of Justice re um, rejected appeals by Poland and Hungary um, over basically the withholding of the money. So partly as a result of the fees it's had to pay, uh, Poland now owes something like 116 million euros um, for its violations of the rule of law. And the EU is now uh, hoping to withhold additional money over COVID recovery funds and others. Um, and Poland here basically initially tried to argue that accepting all the Ukrainian refugees meant that Poland should not be fined, but the, the argument is failing. And so we see sort of, you know, new, there's always been a slightly more differential relationship to the European Union. And now with these fines accumulating, we actually see uh, the Polish government attempting to undo some of its more autocratic um, attempts to control the judiciary. So what I would argue is I think, you know, Poland, what we see in Poland is worrisome, but it's not very clear that it'll follow the Hungarian path to sort of full autocracy. Um, in Poland, the government is less competent at its autocratic means. It's been unable to 
um, fully control the media, to fully control the kind of message that people are receiving, to control the economy, and even not to be, it's not even capable of controlling the judiciary fully. It's also um, diverging from its one main ally. It's now being very critical of Hungary. And third, it's more differential to the EU. So if, you know, if there is sort of a silver lining here, um, it's that Poland is less likely to follow the Hungarian path. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. And thanks for this positive note also. <laughs> note. Daniel. All right. Thank you very much for having me. Very uh, nice to at least be virtually joining you uh, back in my old haunts there on the farm. Uh, and um, yeah, so I, I'm supposed to be talking, I think, about you know, the EU reaction, enforcement, lack of enforcement. In essence, okay, um, uh, Kim and Anna have depicted very well uh, the, the problems in the two countries, but how do we get out of this mess? But before I even get there, let me just say something, which is, um, because I think everyone listening may be a bit shocked, like Kim said at the beginning, you know, this is happening, there's backsliding happening everywhere, but this is happening in an EU member state. How can that be happening within the EU, it's supposed to be a union of democracies? It's right there in the EU treaties, Article 2, other articles I could mention on independent judiciaries. But anyway, the EU is supposed to be composed of democracies. Well, I guess my first point, without going into it much, just to say the way I approach these things is through a kind of lens of comparative politics, and comparative politics tells us do not be surprised. Uh, unions, like federal type unions all over the world that are democracies, it's very common that they have certain states that are autocracies. There's a whole literature on subnational authoritarianism. One of my Stanford classmates back in the day, Carlos Gervasoni from Argentina has written a lot about it because Argentina is a great example of that historically. So anyway, we shouldn't be surprised that a, a democratic union has certain authoritarian member states. Um, but then the last thing I'll say about that is it, that doesn't present us with a happy picture because unfortunately the lesson there is this can last for a long time, right? In the US, we had pockets of authoritarianism in the South for eight decades after the Civil War, right? With one party states run by Democrats, right? Uh, anyway, so you know, anyone expecting a quick solution, uh, if anything, what I've argued is the EU's in, even in worse shape and it's stuck in a kind of authoritarian equilibrium or an autocracy trap. But anyway, let's get to the question of wh why the commission hasn't done more about that. Now, some people say it's the lack of tools. The EU lacks the tools it needs. Okay, this is a song and dance we've been hearing for the better part of a decade. And it's true that certain tools are not very effective. The famous, for those who study these things or follow them, Article 7, which is a mechanism in the treaties for sanctioning states with systemic rule of law violations, that uh, to really enter the penalty phase requires that you get unanimous agreement of the other states, okay? And that's not gonna happen, not just because, um, as Anna was saying, the, the historic uh, vetoing of Poland and Hungary helping each other out, right? Uh, Kim has had a, a clever proposal of how that could be circumvented. But even beyond that, you're always gonna find one member state to like veto action if it requires unanimity. So it's true that certain tools like that are weak. But in a more general sense, the idea that the problem here is that the commission or the EU lacks tools is ludicrous. The EU has lots of tools. Our friend uh, Laurent Pesch, professor from London, uh, it talks about the new rule of law instrument creation cycle, like this dance they go through, where every time there's a further attack on democracy and the rule of law, then EU leaders say, okay, the problem is we need to create a new tool, right, which they then spend two years doing. That's just an excuse for inaction. As the old saying goes, a bad workman always blames his tools. Um, you know, and basically the EU is just, you know, playing around uh, creating new tools while the house is falling apart right uh, sort of around it. Um, so let's, let's talk about what some of those tools are, right? Um, and then I'll say something at the end, because you're probably wondering, why isn't it using its tools? I'll say something about that at the end, but I'll, I'll be fast here. I know I've just got a few minutes. Okay, number one tool, that, um, something Kim and I have written about. Uh, I think our first article on this was four years ago. The EU should stop funding autocracy. Now, let me be clear. I'm a Jean Monnet chair, like I'm a big fan of the EU. I'm a Europhile. So I don't say this with any joy, 
but the EU is probably the biggest funder in the world of democratic backsliding. Think about that chart that Kim showed at the beginning of the two most rapid backsliders in the past decade. I'm not saying the most authoritarian regimes, but the two that have slid the furthest of the decade were both EU member states, Hungary and Poland. That's all financed by the EU. So the EU, for starters, could stop funding autocracy. Um, now, there, there's been a lot, and Anna referred to this, there's this new rule of law conditionality regulation, which von der Leyen just said on April 5th, the commission would soon be triggering against Hungary, probably not against Poland. I had a piece on Tuesday in the Monkey Cage blog of the Washington Post explaining why I'm pretty suspicious of this. And I think, in fact, this tool could be very powerful. They could use it to great effect to suspend the funds and have a big impact on these regimes but I'm afraid they're gonna use it in a, a very negligible way, just making marginal suspensions of some funds and not use it with full force. And then of course not use it at all on Poland. Um, and I can talk about that in the Q and A, but you know, if that turns out to be right, then it'll be back to that cycle I talked about, rule of law instrument cycle. They will have wasted four years because that's they proposed this thing four years ago. And in fact, if they do it in this minimalist way, just fighting corruption, they were already empowered to suspend funds on corruption grounds decade ago. Two, you know, as long as they've had these structural funds, there was a regulation that it allowed them to suspend funds on corruption grounds, and they had done it several times. So there's like nothing new there if that's all it amounts to. Okay, I'm almost done, Christoph. Am I okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, the other big thing in terms of tools. The commission could make much stronger use of its traditional enforcement tools like the infringement procedure, where you sue member states before the court of justice for uh, violating EU law. Now, something my uh, co-author Tommaso Pavona and I have written about is that there's been a dramatic reduction in the commission's use of this infringements where they sue states over the past uh, six to 18 years, actually right? Dramatic, like 80% down. And that has affected the rule of law crisis where also they've brought very few infringements. So they could bring more infringements on many more issues. They could bring them more aggressively where they do things like request interim measures, which is like where they order injunctions to stop behavior. They finally did that against Poland, against the disciplinary tribunal, which you mentioned. They could also make more use of the ability to fine states. Again, with Poland, they finally started fining Poland a million euros a day over this disciplinary tribunal, but they could do that for many more things, right? Think about all these violations. You know, they keep bringing these too late and too weak. They could also explore uh, Kim's idea of systemic infringements where they group together a bunch of these infringements and say that collectively they amount to uh, a violation of the core kind of democratic article two values. Okay, and look, there's more I could say uh, about you know, other things national courts could do. Um, some people think you might be able to take action before the uh, ECJ saying that the council is operating illegally because actually the council where the governments sit is supposed to be composed of democracies. That's article 10 of the treaty, right? Uh, John Cotter's written on that. I think Kim's writing something on that, that um, you know, if, if you have autocracies in the council, then that should be illegal. But I guess the last thing I'd say there, these are all good ideas, you know, but ultimately courts can't save democracy in the EU by themselves. Right. Even if the commission gets more aggressive, we need EU leaders. Yes, those in the commission, but also the national leaders in the council to more actively denounce the autocrats in their midst, distance themselves from them. I mean, Zelensky said tougher things against Orban than any European leader has ever said. Right. Way tougher. Uh, it's just shocking. Um, longer term, the EU needs to guarantee fair elections. There's no, the, the EU needs a voting rights act. There's nothing like that. Euro parties, these European level political parties need to crack down on their pet autocrats that are members. Um, anyway, I, I could say more, I'll say for the q and I could say more about the politics of why the commission hasn't done more and other e-leaders, but I'll just say it's, it's for many of the same reasons in national settings that um, you know, leaders allow these enclaves to survive also apply in the EU, but happy to talk about that in the Q&A, thanks. Thanks, Dan, and thanks all three of you for these great opening remarks. Um, I just want to remind everybody, you can enter your questions in the, using the Q&A feature. Um, while you are doing that, I will ask a few questions uh, myself. I will start uh, myself by asking a few questions. First, I want to ask a bit of a general question 
uh, to all three of you related to uh, some of the remarks that were made re related especially to Anna's second point about the relationship between um, Hungary and Poland and how uh, their um, reactions to the war in Ukraine uh, can change also the dynamics within uh, the EU. So um, you could see a scenario, I don't know how likely it is, it is in a way my question for, uh, for all of you. You could see a scenario where uh, the war in Ukraine and the reactions of Orban and the leaders in Poland um, sort of makes the situation worse for Orban, it isolates him more in the EU. Um, you could foresee a scenario where uh, Poland doesn't uh, veto uh, sanctions on, on uh, Hungary and so on. Um, whereas the situation may actually be good for Poland. If you watch the news in the past few weeks and months uh, about Poland, Poland suddenly uh, comes across as uh, the Polish government, as, a, as a, the nice guys in the whole uh, story. Um, so uh, is this is the war in Ukraine good for the uh, po for the Polish government? And is there a risk that as a result of this, they may get away or continue to get away with more uh, backsliding than they otherwise would have gotten away with? So these are sort of um, a bunch of questions related to the war in Ukraine and the impact on uh, the relationship between Poland and Hungary. So any three of you who would want to say anything about that, uh, please go ahead. Maybe I can just say something about what happened with Hungary and the war in Ukraine. So the war broke out in the middle of this election campaign, right? And my cat is just showing up. Um, anyway, it broke out in the middle of the election campaign. And it turns out that, you know, Orban had preconditioned uh, his fans uh, to be suspicious of Ukraine. And the reason why is because Ukraine had passed in 2018 and 2019 two laws, one of which made Ukrainian the official language of the Ukrainian state so that all the other second languages, it was aimed at Russian, you know, were demoted. And the second law was one that eliminated what had been a really admirable network of bilingual schools, again, aimed at Russians. Well, it turns out there's Hungarians uh, in Ukraine too. There's a 150,000 strong population of Ukrainians just over the border from uh, Hungary into Ukraine. Um, and Orban had been campaigning since 2018 against you know, sequences of, of Ukrainian governments that had failed to stand up for, not my cat, that had failed to stand up for the ethnic Hungarians in that part of the world. So as soon as the election, uh, as soon as the war broke out in the middle of the election, Orban pivoted to saying, and he had been buddies with Putin, right? So he said, well, look, you know, somebody has to be the peacemaker. Somebody has to talk to Putin. You know, somebody has to actually be the grown up in the room. And he portrayed himself as that. Then he said, why should we defend Ukrainians if the Ukrainian government doesn't defend Hungarians? A nationalist appeal, which, you know, if that's the pitch he puts forward in Poland, might actually also be appealing. I mean, that's certainly similar to what the what the Polish government argues for itself. Um, and then finally, what uh, what Orban did, and this shows you just how autocratic politics works, he accused the opposition baselessly of wanting to run in and join the Ukrainian war, sending Hungarian soldiers over the border now. And on the eve of the campaign, he said, you know, Peter Markizai, the, the prime ministerial candidate for the opposition, has had a secret pact with Zelensky, right? I mean, what country in the, what democracy in the world wouldn't want some secret pact with Zelensky? He's the star of the moment, right? But the opposition had no access to the media to fight any of those baseless charges. So Orban has now really positioned himself against Ukraine and um, in favor of, if not directly in favor of Russia, then in favor of negotiations with Russia. And I can imagine him pivoting to say that stopping the fighting and his, he will try to take credit for anything that stops the fighting. That may put him back in Poland's good graces, but Anna can say whether that would really happen. Um, yes, I think the situation is very different in Poland. Um, Poland has been unequivocal in condemning Putin. It is unequivocally on the side of Ukrainians. Uh, the Polish prime minister and Kaczynski himself have gone to visit Zelensky. Um, so I think that that's a very different relationship there to Putin and to Russia. Um, now, having said that, you know, with the Poland has also been accepting something like by this point, I think three and a half million refugees from Ukraine. And the Polish government rather cynically turned to the EU and said, well, in that case, 
to compensate us for these costs of these refugees, why don't you um, start paying, you know, start basically either stop penalizing us or start giving us some of the COVID recovery fund that you withheld. Um, and that actually made it look pretty bad in the eyes of Polish society. So, you know, suffered an immediate drop um, in support, largely because all these refugees from Ukraine had been accepted by Polish citizens. There are no government run refugee camps. There's no sort of systematic effort by the government. This is all run entirely by civil society. Um, which I think also, you know, bodes well for the future because it suggests that there's still, still enough sort of, you know, a propensity or a capacity for collective action, that the kind of path that we see in Hungary um, may not be quite as likely. Now, does that really change anything in the long run with its relationship to either Hungary or the EU? I don't think so. Um, I mean, po both Poland and Hungary have a very strong interest in keeping the EU out of their domestic attempts to consolidate authoritarian regimes. And it really hasn't changed its really, Poland's relationship to the EU, which continues to be marked both by sort of, you know, uh, provocation and deference. Um, so I don't think it's, you know, it's, even though it's very different from Hungary, I don't think it's going to change much over the long run. All right, Dan? Yeah, well, I would just say I agree um, with everything we just heard. And on Anna's point, I very much agree that while there were, in terms of the EU angle and kind of, um, you know, sanctions, we, we should keep in mind before the invasion, right, the EU was sort of ramping up, they had withheld the COVID recovery funds from both Hungary and Poland, there was talk of in, uh, triggering this rule of law conditionality mechanism, which could mean, you know, as I explained, suspension of even more funds. Um, and uh, I think because of, um, you know, what's happened with all the refugees going to Poland, I think the Commission is really wants to do anything possible to send Poland its money because it thinks it's very bad optics not to. Now, that being said, the Polish government and uh, the justice minister is kind of making it hard for the commission because they are being so defiant of some of the things that the commission just wants them to maybe even make cosmetic changes so they have an excuse to hand out the money. I don't know how that'll play out. Anna could say more, but uh, you know, so far, uh, the difference is that the commission is, I think, you know, somewhat more, um, you know, uh, staying the line with suspending at least some of Hungary's money, whereas with Poland, you know, it's taking a different line. But I do think in the long term, uh, their common interest of Hungary and Poland in keeping the EU out of their business will overcome their big differences over Russia. They'll just put foreign policy on one side, but they'll still stick together and support each other vis-a-vis -vis Brussels. If I could just add, you know, when it comes to the Polish uh, Minister of Justice, He's actually becoming a thorn in the side of not just the EU, but of the political of the governing political party. He's very ambitious. He's made it clear that he wants to be, you know, the next prime minister, um, and that's seen as a total non-starter by sort of the, the mainstream of the party. So it may very well be that thanks to sort of you know, internal party factions, he might get removed, and we might see a different set of um, rule of law policies in Poland. But. Who knows? One difference with Hungary is that Orban has never allowed factions. He just expels people from the party. That's right. Like I said, competence, right? <laughs> I have a, another uh, question or a set of questions, basically for each of you, a somewhat different question, but both related to, uh, uh, all related to what you expect uh, to happen in, uh, in the near future. Uh, maybe I'll start with Poland. Um, uh, the elections, the next elections in Poland are still uh, a little bit away, but um, from my uh, limited understanding of Polish politics, I would say there's still a chance there that uh, a larger chance that there was in, uh, than there was in Hungary, that the government will be voted out of office. How likely, how likely do you think, Anna, that uh, the government uh, may uh, not be reelected next time around? You know, a lot can happen in, in uh, two years, right, or three years. Um, but, you know, I, I would say that the Polish government, the peace government, is genuinely popular. Um, it has, it's not just vote rigging or gerrymandering the way that, you know, we can attribute a large chunk of the electorate of the vote um, in Hungary. Most of the support is absolutely genuine, and it's never reached above 50%. It's usually been, you know, 38 40%. But it's there because the government has pushed through several policies that are very popular, including sort of, you know, payments for children, children subsidies, extra pensions for pensioners, um, and you know, attempt, attempts to deal with inflation, all of which are genuinely popular and have built this party a pretty solid base. So if that continues and, you know, the barring the opposition truly uniting, I think we're likely to see another victory, at least in the next year or two. 
All right. So not that optim optimistic in that respect. Mm -hmm. There are limits. <laughs> now, I want to ask Kim also, um, like, I mean, you you uh, drew a very grim picture of the for the future of Hungary and its uh, democratic character. Where do you see the opposition go from now? Do you think there's a chance it will remain united? Will it splinter and become even weaker? Um, do you have any ideas about that? Well, so the good news is that we all expected the opposition to start, you know, blaming each other after the election. And there was a little bit of that, but not nearly as much as you normally would get in Hungary. So there's at least some chance that this this very jerry jerry rigged kind of team, which would not normally work together, has actually been working together now long enough that they're trying to think about some way forward. Um, and so they're trying to figure out what do they do if there's no hope of them having any influence in the parliament at all. Remember, the last government also now prevents the opposition from speaking in the parliament. They find people people for speaking out of line. If so, the opposition would come in with signs that they try to hold in front of the cameras, and then they would get fined for you know. I mean, it's just an unbelievable situation. So they're they're starting to talk about just boycotting the parliament and just not you know trying trying belatedly to do what Dan suggested, which is just to delegitimate at every turn all of the institutions. Um, the problem though, and this is about sort of the EU and what it can do. One reason why I think the EU has not been more active with regard to Hungary before now is that unlike in Poland, in Hungary, there's no obvious op competent opposition to take charge. Um, and even if you were to get a people in there, even if the opposition were to win an election or um, we forget that in 2009, there was a caretaker government kind of put in by the IMF because the country went bankrupt and Hungary, because of a lot of the election giveaways and combined with not getting EU funds, Hungary may well be bankrupt again. And so there's a lot of things that could happen that are not in the electoral box. Um, but, but the EU wants there to be somebody it can work with and it doesn't see who it can work with actually. Um, so the EU, I think will charge along toward cutting funds um, and that will also be tough for the opposition, right? Because the opposition has advocated cutting funds. And when that happens, there are gonna be people who hurt in Hungary and the opposition will be, will be blamed for that. So, you know, the opposition's not in good shape. Um, the opposition is, you know, has gotten a habit of working together and we'll see, they have lots of new challenges and we haven't begun to see them stand, you know, standing up for it. But, you know, it's not as hopeless, that part is not as hopeless as we might've thought. Mm -hmm. All right. Then my last question is for Dan, uh, also about the future and what you expect the Commission to do or the EU in general to do in the next few months. I mean, we've been hoping at numerous occasions that the Commission would finally get its act together and be um, more effective in handling the situation. Do you think that, that this will really happen now in the weeks and months ahead? Again, I say this, uh, you know, with no pleasure and great personal pain, actually, but I'm afraid I don't foresee that. I think I wrote a piece recently where I, I used the, the analogy of, you know, that it's like, like a cancer and like most cancers, you know, if left untreated, they metastasize and then eventually they go from wherever the place where they start to the vital organs. And that's when you're in trouble, right? And uh, basically, I think what's happening is Kim said it at the beginning, Orban has his eyes on, on Europe, on Brussels. You know, he knows he can kind of uh, hold together his local autocratic regime, but his ambitions are greater. They are to spread that model to like his mini me in Slovenia, Jansa, and others. He's trying to promote this in EU enlargement policy. By the way, the, the commission, right? Uh, let me just explain to everyone. Uh, when Ursula von der Leyen wanted to become commission president. She needed votes in the parliament to get a majority. She needed votes both from Orban's people and from Kaczynski's people. So she cut deals with them, basically indicating she goes soft on rule of law you know, for their votes. They voted for her. And part of that deal, she gave enlargement policy to a minion of Orban's, this guy, Oliver Varhe. So they've been soft peddling rule of law issues in Serbia and elsewhere and giving glowing report cards that every NGO would laugh at. Why? Because it's an Orban guy um, trying to help Vucic, the Serbian strongman who's an Orban ally. So in other words, um, they've invaded the castle, right? They're not like just outside the gates, they're inside. They have 
portfolios like enlargement. Uh, and I'm afraid that, you know, um, I'm afraid, in fact, that like this rule of law conditionality, they'll trigger it because they must be seen to be doing something, right? But they'll trigger it in a weak way, suspend a bit of money in, you know, while handing out lots of money with the other hand, and it won't really hurt Orban. So I'm afraid that, I mean, there are good people in the commission who want to do something about this issue. I think someone like Eurova or Reinders, some of the commissioners, but I don't think they have the, the power. I think von der Leyen is bad news. All right. I can, can I just add one thing sure. to that? Von der Leyen was worse news when Merkel was in. <laughs> Oh, the well, German government, <laughs> right? The German government switch has made, I think, a big difference to this issue. In particular, the new German government has in their in their coalition agreement a whole section on rule of law, saying this is one of their priorities for for the EU. And sure enough, you know, that I don't think the conditionality regulation would still be being discussed if it weren't for that. So I think that, and we'll see what happens with the French election too, like right now, Macron has got his hands full. So, you know, but if the other elections go in a, in a pro uh, rule of law fashion, then I think actually the conditionality regulation will accomplish something. And, and I might say, and you know, Anna mentioned this, but the radicalness of what's already happened, I think shouldn't be underestimated. Neither Poland nor Hungary got their recovery funds approved, mm -hmm. which means that half of the funds they thought they were getting are not even on the way. And we were surprised because we thought they'd have to, you know, give out the money and then invoke the conditionality regulation. They jumped straight to not giving out the funds in the first place. And I think that, I mean, I've been trying to confirm this, but I gather that the MFF funds don't go either if they if the governments haven't met the conditions that are in place to, to issue the recovery funds. So already, the, you know, Europe is holding back. And I might add with regard to Anna that this, this million euro fine, and there's a couple of fines, right? Because there's also the forest fine. The, um, the commission just announced like, by the way, <laughs> you know, by the way, what we're doing is we're deducting those money we would otherwise send to the member state. I proposed that 10 years ago and EU law experts jumped all over me saying the commission doesn't have that power. They need a regular, you know, they need some explicit authorization to do it. And now the commission just did it and nobody's complaining. So they're already holding withholding funds. That makes me think that actually they may do something with the conditionality regulation. Thanks. Let's turn to the questions from the audience now. And I see that Kim and Dan have already answered several of the questions uh, in the Q&A box. So I don't need to uh, repeat those questions. Um, I'll start out with um, a question about money and whether withholding money is really enough to uh, change uh, the minds uh, of the uh, people in power in Hungary and Poland, or is can more I, needed. Can I say something about that one? Sure. Um, well, okay, first thing, you never know till you try, right? But ha uh, handing them billions clearly hasn't worked, right? Uh, and, you know, the what I often say about the EU money, it functions uh, just like uh, Stanford professor Terry Carl wrote a lot of, of course, about um, the, the way uh, the resource curse and the way if you have like oil money that helps support autocracies, right? Well, uh, EU countries don't have that, but they have a commission fund, you know, EU funding functions like oil money, right, that the aspiring autocrat can distribute to their kind of clientelistic network and prop up their regime. I mean, look, Hungary, 80% of public investment in Hungary is funded by the EU, okay? So, of course, as money is already being suspended, as Kim mentioned, and if more is suspended, that can have a real difference on regimes who depend on this money for you know their survival. Yeah, and if I can just add one thing, which is going to end with a question to Anna, because the Hungarian government, it, it, it makes a lot of ideological pronouncements, which Orban doesn't believe, right? He's defending Christian Europe. No one's ever seen him in a church. He you know, claims to be a culture warrior. He doesn't actually hate any of the groups personally that he condemns. So he's completely a hypocrite. What the Hungarian government exists to do is to put public money in private pockets. That's the through line of everything Orban's up to. If there is no more public money to put into private pockets, one of the questions is whether his oligarchs start to turn on him, you know, and, and whether his, he can hold the system together if it's not you know, feathering everybody's nest with government money. So I think there's a real serious 
possibility that this will crack the structure that holds Orban in place. And so my question to Anna is that one of the ways in which the Polish government may be quote unquote incompetent is that it's not corrupt uh, or not as corrupt as the Orban government. So, you know, it just seems to me that money is much less of an incentive for the Polish government than it is for the Hungarian government. Is that true? I think that's absolutely right. In fact, you know, the Polish government has been busy basically using this money to buy votes. So it's spreading it out to, you know, in the family for subsidies, the additional housing subsidies, all of that. But there's very little evidence of massive enrichment by the government itself. Um, and I think it gets to the question that's posed in the comments about sort of, you know, why did Peace and Fidesz get elected in the first place? And I think you know, there are sort of two slightly different versions. In Hungary, it was in response to the self-admitted deception and corruption of the socialist government, right? I mean, those tapes that got leaked in 2006 where basically the prime minister, the newly elected prime minister says, we lied to them day and night about the state of the economy. Um, and so this enormous sort of charge of anger at that kind of you know, casual deception gets Fidesz elected in 2010. In Poland, it's also discussed with the previous governing parties, with these kind of policies that literally the previous government wanted to offer warm water from the faucet, right? I mean, that was sort of its big claim to a policy stance and a vision for Poland. And in both cases, I think it's the failure of these mainstream governing parties to act in non-corrupt ways to actually offer an alternative to be responsive and accountable to the voters. And in that situation, you know, in 2015 and 2010, peace and fetus both looked great, right? I mean, they, you know, they were responsive, they're accountable, they spoke the language of the people, they promised change good change in Poland. Um, and of course, once they can office, they got an office, it was a very different story. But I think this speaks to a deeper sort of malaise of post-communist party politics and representation. And Anna, sort of following up on what Kim was saying also, do you think that the, uh, the Polish government leaders are just as cynical as, um, as Orban is? And that is that they don't really uh, believe in the cultural uh, values that they uh, claim to uh, defend, or do you think that they actually believe in all these things? I think the the older stalwarts like Kaczynski actually do believe in this. They are nationalists, they are conservative, they are religious, they're obsessed with the 2010 tragedy, the Smolensk tragedy that basically decapitated the Polish governing elite in a huge plane crash. Right? So there's an obsession, they're re rewriting history of extirpating communism with fighting those old battles. For the younger generation, for people like Morawiecki, the current prime minister, or Duda, the, the president, I think those commitments are much uh, more attenuated. And I think they're much more cynically there for the power and for sort of, you know, um, governing Poland as they see fit. But those, you know, the, I think the older generation in peace is very much so for a set of, old, of real believers, much more so than in Hungary. All right. There's also another question about uh, the withholding of money, um, and uh, it's particularly uh, phrased in, uh, with respect to Hungary, but it could also apply to Poland, I guess. If money were to be withheld, is there a chance that uh, Hungary or Poland, for that matter, would uh, decide to leave or hold a referendum on leaving the EU? Uh, no. <laughs> I, would, I would say the probability is zero. Yeah, uh, I think the, yeah, the popular, first of all, Populations in Poland and Hungary are very supportive of EU membership. Uh, and like, if you want to make people go to the streets and go ballistic against the government, try doing that, number one. And number two, their economies are totally integrated with the EU economy, you know, German FDI, others just trade. It's it, it, no, it, they, they might threaten that, but it's a bluff. And I'm going to say, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I, but this is also part of the reason why they were are working so hard on change the EU from within, right? They don't want to live the, leave the EU. They want to make the EU more compatible with their regimes. And actually, there's an even darker side here, and it also pertains to NATO, which can't throw out member states either. And that is, if the EU is going to defund Hungary, Hungary has already made, this is why Orban is going to Russia. This is why Orban is befriending Xi in China. This is why Orban's made deals with all these Gulf states. He's going around to states that don't care if Hungary's a democracy and making various under the table deals. These treaties are held as state secrets for the next 50 years. And what is probably in some of them are deals that these states will fund Hungary if it gets defunded from the EU. They may already be funding Hungary. So what are they paying for? They're paying for Hungary to make these institutions, the EU and NATO less effective. 
And they may be paying Hungary to, to siphon information out of these institutions to hostile forces. I think NATO has already concluded that because Hungary has been left out of the loop on a lot of the information. That's one reason why Hungary is kicking up a fuss about Ukraine. Um, but as long as you're in the highest clubs in the, in the world, you can, you can sell your membership or sell your you know, ability to disrupt to the states that would pay you for doing so. And I'm worried that that's what's coming next. Yeah, and we've seen that already, right? As, as you know, you know, you've seen like Hungary blocking EU statements over China and Hong Kong, yeah, things right. like that. And over Russia. You know, yeah, and the pro, all the various pro-Russia uh, positions it's taken, so. Yep. Yep, all and right. it could get worse. <laughs> yeah. There's a couple of questions uh, left. There's a question about transnational social movements and whether they can sort of help uh, in uh, bringing about um, if I understand it correctly, uh, in bringing about change in Poland and Hungary. I can I, I, I want to say something about this and that, real quickly, and I'd be curious what um, Anna and Kim think. I mean, you know, a lot of people, they say, well, you know, ultimately um, the problems in these countries, you know, can only be resolved by Poles or by Hungarians and, you know, mobilizing to either defend in Poland's case or try to restore in Hungary's case their democracies. And of course, there's a lot of truth to that. But then at the same time, I think when you look at like this kind of comparative literature I talked about, like there's this famous book by Ed Gibson from Northwestern talking about authoritarian enclaves within bigger po political systems where he says, the key is you've got to, you know, the, these autocrats, if they do get entrenched, you know, they kind of establish a boundary around their state where they they control things so tightly and you, ha you have to break their boundary control, sometimes by forces from elsewhere in the polity helping the beleaguered opposition, things like that. So part of me wonders, you know, yeah, maybe transnational social movements for various rights that are being violated or just to support the opposition. I think that could be part of breaking the grip. And, I, and there's another reason too, I think related to EU law. And I think the EU is contemplating this, certainly in the area of political parties, where they've been moving ahead toward Euro-wide lists instead of voting for your own national member state parties. But they've also been talking about actually funding transnational uh, social networks. And one of the great things that that would do is that if the Hungarians tried to audit, shut down and harass the transnational um, NGOs, the way they harass the national ones, then they would be in violation of EU law, I think, if the EU has funded them or, or in some other way taken jurisdiction over them. And so it would be a protection for the NGO sector in Hungary, the civil society sector, if there were some transnational influence that gave the EU at least some jurisdiction over what happened. You know, that said, I'd be a bit wary, um, only because the one anti-EU appeal that works in both Poland and Hungary is to talk about violation or threatening the sovereignty, right? And for Poland, especially, national sovereignty is such a touchy issue that this is the one anti-EU criticism that actually makes, makes headway. And so if suddenly, you know, transnational parties and transnational uh, NGOs are being protected by the EU, I can conceive of an argument whether it's resonant or not is a different story. But this is yet another violation of national sovereignty with sort of you know, all the concomitant political hay that that might allow them to make. But. Yeah, well, Orban would certainly say that, but, and here's, I see a question in the chat about like who would be the next you know, great civil society leader for, for Orban, uh, for uh, Hungary. And I think the answer is that I'm not sure we know right now, which is to say the opposition needs some time to shake out. but. I think what this election showed us is that Orban's base is about 30%. I mean, as you said, for peace, as we said, for Trump, there was another question that sort of related to that. These autocratic characters can generate about a third of the public in all these states. They can't get to half or they can't get to electoral majorities without something more. Um, and so that's where all the election rigging and stuff and, and nationalist appeals or anti-nationalist appeals or whatever come in. The opposition in Hungary seems to have a base of about 25%. And it's having trouble getting beyond that. And so the transnational social movements would be to support that 25%, which is already being accused of being, you know, of having, you know, this is where the Shorish network comes in. This is the whole network of global liberalists or whatever it is they call them. You know, so, I mean, it's already being tarred with that brush. It might as well get some support. Um, and then we'll see if we can turn the 25% of that Hungarian opposition into something that can win elections. The Hungarian opposition is always good for answering the question, how much worse can it get? 
Yes, <laughs> true. <laughs> There's one last question for Anna about um, related to the war in Ukraine and how long Poland can uh, take in so many refugees and deal with the uh, fallout of the economic sanctions. Ah, uh, right. That's the million dollar question. Um, I think, you know, already there were some voices about why is it that the Ukrainians get allowed, you know, free bus passes and why is it they're allowed, you know, food and all this other stuff. And then very quickly got tamped down. So, so far, you know, solidarity is holding. Um, people are appalled by what they are seeing. And with every revelation of new human rights abuses of torture, rape, looting, et cetera, et cetera, that's happening in Russia is only hardening the resolve of civil society in Poland to protect the refugees. Um, but as the war wears on for, you know, month, it look, it's looking like it might be months, if not years, that of course is subject to change, especially if the government doesn't step in and provide more sort of structured help and more integration of the refugees into Polish society. Can I tag a question on for Anna about that? Because my understanding, looking at comparative migration rates in Hungary and Poland, was that Poland had already taken in about a million Ukrainian mm -hmm. guest workers. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how many of the Ukrainian refugees are family reunifications with those guest workers who are already present. So I, I don't know the statistics on the reunifications. What I do know is that precisely because there's already been a million Ukrainians since the 1990s um, yeah. in Poland, they're widely accepted and they're seen as, you know, one of ours, quote unquote. And so there's this weird divergence where, you know, Syrian refugees and non-Christian refugees are absolutely not welcome. But, you know, four million Ukrainians are seen as, you know, part of the fabric of society. But I don't know whether they're coming to reunify with um, the workers that are already there. All right. I'm afraid we've come to the end of our discussion already. Uh, it was great. So thank you very much, uh, all three of you, for your uh, participation, for taking time off uh, to do this um, at a time that is undoubtedly very busy for all three of you. Uh, I'm sure that uh, this topic will remain very prevalent in the next uh, months and years. Uh, so we'll sure be having other events on this topic also at the Europe Center, I'm sure. Our next event this calendar year, this academic year, is in two weeks. We'll have Andrea Aldrich from Yale University, and she will be talking about uh, women in party leadership roles uh, in Europe. That's in two weeks from today. So we'll, we hope to see all of you there again uh, in two weeks. So thank you very much for your uh, participation and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely to see everybody. Oh I'm also in the participant list. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.